we're going to be going through this cylinder head. Now, this is a 1995-96 style second generation Eclipse cylinder head. And you'll be able to determine that because the cam angle sensor is on the timing gear side. So it actually rides on a, a Hall effect sensor on the back of the intake cams. It's important whenever you're moving a cylinder head around, if it's completely assembled and it's got the cams in it, that uh, you uh, set it down on its end or on the intake side because what you don't want to do is set it down on its face. Because when the cams are installed, several of the lobes are going to actually have the valves sticking out and if you were to set this down on its face, it would crash into the valves, probably bending them, causing damage to the cylinder head. So you always want to keep it up on its end or on its side, never face down. On a 90 to 94 first generation cylinder head or on a 97 to 99 second generation, there's a cam angle sensor that protrudes from this side of the head. If you plan on setting it down on that end, remove that part before you pull it off the motor. I'm going to go ahead and put this back on the block so that I can work on it level and flat and uh, remove the camshafts and then we're going to mo move on to removing the valve springs, retainers, rockers, lifters, the rest of the goodies. I'm sure there's a few of you who haven't been inside a cylinder head before, so I'm going to take a minute to go over the basic parts of it. These are the camshafts. They're held in by cam caps. They squish down on a series of rocker arms, and these are roller rocker arms, so they have a little bearing that spins against the cam surface to reduce friction. And they're suspended to eliminate lash by hydraulic lash adjusters that are just below these points. But since we're going to take the camshafts out, there's, you'll get to see how these things work. Now over here on the other side, we have the valve springs and the retainers and the keepers for these retainers are, uh, are what we're going to be removing here shortly. So in order for us to get to that, we need to first take the camshaft out. Mitsubishi has a specified order of taking the bolts loose. And uh, in order to deal with the, um, the cam seal that we've got over here on this side, it's, it kind of makes life easy to remove the, uh, the cam gears. And I'm not going to spend all day on that. I'm just going to use an impact wrench and buzz that right off. There's a hex cast into the camshaft, and that gives you a surface for you to be able to slap a monkey wrench or something on to hold the camshaft still while you're working on the bolt on this side. That way when you put an impact wrench on here, you're not freewheeling it and spinning it without oil pressure. But uh, it's got them on both camshafts, and it's important to have both of these marks for intake and exhaust. Now, I'm not going to have any questions about which ones they are. These are HKSs, and they're actually marked I and E, uh, and 264 and 272. So, anyway. I used red thread locker on that bolt when I assembled it. You need to make note of stuff like this whenever you're taking things apart because anytime you use red Loctite, you should always go back and run a tap through it to make sure you've uh, cleaned all that stuff out. Or else you might be feeding it a bolt that winds up destroying the threads inside the part. All right. When you're removing the cam caps, Mitsubishi also specifies that you remove this one first, this one next, this one next, this one next, this one next, and this one next. And when I disassemble these and remove them, I'm going to keep them all lined up. But it's important to note that they have markings on all of them. This one right here didn't impress all the way, but it's supposed to have an E right there with an arrow. That one says E2, E3, E4, E5. We're going to go ahead and start disassembling it. And I'm just breaking them loose first. Alright, they've already lifted up on me. I'm happy about that. This one has sealing on it, so usually it puts up a little fight. Ooh, that's nice and loose now. If this one puts up a fight, there's a little edge underneath that lip. You can take a pry bar and lightly lift to dislodge this piece, and you can also do that on the front side. This one didn't put up a fight at all, but let's see how that one does when it comes off. 
As you remove each cam cap, scrape your fingernail across the journal of each cam cap and also the cam journal. A light groove or two isn't a deal breaker as long as both surfaces aren't wiped across their faces. It's damage that results from metal shavings being pumped through the oil supply that can create the biggest problems because high spots develop from metal being embedded inside the journals. That does the most damage. If they're damaged, you'll need the cam caps shaved and the bores line honed. Possibly even need cams ground if it lowers their center line in the head so that you don't bind up lifters or break rockers after you put it back together. There's the camshaft. Comes right out. You want to lift straight up on it when you take it out. Yeah, the journals look pretty decent. Look a little bit of scratching on it, but uh, anyway. You see the HKS as they mark the cam size on the hex. So there's 272. That's my exhaust cam. I like the fact that it's oily, so I'm going to leave it that way. And what I'm going to do here is just attach some of this stretch wrap. <laughs> Drop it all over the place. It's kind of hard to do this when it's oily. I just want to do this to protect the cam. Yes, I left the seal on it. I'm going to go ahead and put the caps back on, just so we don't lose track of those. We do the same thing with the other side. When you do this, put your thumb on top of it because you can send it flying onto the floor. We don't want that. Push the seal out a little bit. And now, lift straight up. We got can shaft number two. There you go. All right, so what's left in here? We have our rockers, we have our lifters, springs, and retainers. We have to keep all of these things separated and uh, identified with which one of the valves they go on. The reason this is important is because their sizes and wear marks are unique. Mismatching parts introduces different wear patterns on contact surfaces, which can shorten their life. Also, if we find a deeper problem on any particular valve, we can go back and reference all the parts connected with it. Oh, what on earth are you doing now, Jaffro? Ice cube trays, really? Yep, really. So I'm going to mark the side of the ice cube tray that the cam gears went on. And just in case I forget, I'm going to mark them intake an exhaust and that'll make perfect sense oh no I got another one all right what I do with these things since there's 16 ice cube tray holes is I put all my rocker arms in each one of these and I do the same with the lifters Now that I have the lifters and the cam followers out, or the rocker arms, the uh, rest of these parts are pretty much going to stay in here and I can flip the head over and not risk losing uh, any of the pieces. This is a cylinder head I got back around 2004, I think. You're going to see more of it as these videos progress because this one has 68,000 miles on it and has never been machined in any way. It came off a crankwalk car. I mean, well, it came off a 7-bolt, so I guess any of them could be, but that is neither here nor there. Perfectly good stock cylinder head. The previous owner tried to repair his short block three times before giving up and installing a complete 1G motor. 
I've robbed a few oil gallery plugs from it, but other than that, it's sitting just like it was when I got it, just filthier. I didn't get this thing with cams, rockers, or lifters in it. Fine by me. I have shelves full of them. It's got valves and springs in it, but the springs are toast. Still has the original factory valve job, and it's filled with 10 years of flotsam and jetsam. I can still use it for reference, though. Since my head has been ported, decked, radius cut valve jobbed, and an aftermarket valve train installed, I feel like this video series could benefit from this contrast. I won't be the one doing the machining on this job because I'm limited by my available tools. Most everyone watching these videos are in the same boat. Not you, Keith. I know you got it covered. But just because spring load testers, spring death gauges, and milling equipment are out of my reach financially, it doesn't give me a pardon from knowing what I need to ask of my machinist. Because of this arrangement, like many of you already know, if you don't have the tools, then the parts aren't the only expense of doing the job correctly. Work with a machinist you trust and who's willing to put up with your silly requests. Either that, or have your own facts down straight before you get them involved. That's your choice, it's really your responsibility, but it's just easier to communicate when both parties understand the subject material. So that's what I want to share with you in this upcoming series. I have no intention of teaching anyone how to do the machine work themselves. The plan here is to keep it simple. But I can at least shed some light on inspection procedures, what the numbers mean, and how to have peace of mind putting it back together.